Welcome back again to From the Bridge. This is your host and Captain Rick Jones coming to you today from beautiful Wadmalaw Island, South Carolina. We've got a fun show for you today. We're talking once again to my pal Vince Thompson of Melt Sports Entertainment and Culinary in Atlanta, Georgia. Vince has a brand new book coming out entitled Brand You, and he'll be here to talk about the book. We'll step gingerly back up on the old sock box and tell you about another terrific place to eat on the road with Rick. Vince will be here later to talk about his book, Brand You. But let's spend a little time first talking about brands. Here's a definition I, I like. A brand is the promise of the product or, or service in the mind of the consumer. Let me repeat that. A brand is the promise of the product or service in the mind of the consumer. And here's what I know about how consumers respond to brands. They see brands holistically, in totality, and horizontally. Yet so many organizations build their brands in verticals. Like sales doesn't talk to marketing who does not talk to advertising, who doesn't talk to public relations, who doesn't talk to packaging, et cetera, et cetera. But people, fans, consumers, customers, they see brands not in verticals, but as the total package. Let me give you an example. I'm a big fan of Chick-fil-A. I like their history. I like their values. I like their food. I like their attitude, and I like their advertising. All right, let's break it down. Let's talk about the history. There was a guy named Truett Cathy, and he owned a tiny little diner in the 1950s called the Dwarf House. And the Dwarf House was exactly halfway between Atlanta, then called Hartsville Airport, now Hartsville-Jackson Airport, and the Ford Motor Company auto plant in Hapeful, Georgia. So he, he basically had a diner that serviced blue-collar workers, those that worked in the auto factory and those that worked at the airport. Well, during that process, he invented a chicken sandwich, a boneless chicken sandwich with a bunch of flavors that was a big, big seller for him at the Dwarf House. All right, fast forward a few years later. There was a company called Tremble Crow based out of Dallas, Texas, and they started developing some of the first malls in America. And one of the first malls they developed was a mall in the south side of Atlanta called Greenbrier Mall. And Truett Cathy decided that he would want to open a restaurant in the mall. Now, here's a great story. When he first proposed the idea to Tremble Crow, they said, I don't think we want food smells at a mall. Can you imagine that today? If you go to a mall today, you probably only go to a mall to eat. Um, uh, but at that time, they were worried that food smells were going to inhibit the shopping experience. Well, obviously, it worked out. And they opened their first freestanding, I mean, their first uh, mall unit at Greenbrier Mall and then started opening units uh, throughout uh, a million other malls. But then... A couple of decades later, they opened their first freestanding unit. And they actually opened it on the corner of Briarcliff and North Druid Hills Road in Atlanta. And it was a monster success, which led them to open many, many, many more freestanding units all over the country. Pretty interesting history of Chick-fil-A. They're still privately held, okay? And so when you're privately held, you don't have to do things for shareholders. You can do things like you want to do things because you're privately held. Now let's talk about their food. They don't do a lot of things. They do a few things really, really well. And when they add something new, it's because they've done significant market research and trial to make that happen. Chick-fil-A really built their brand by sampling. You would come into a mall, and there would be someone there with a tray, and they would give you a sample of their food. And, um, and that obviously grew their food. They make, obviously, great fried chicken sandwiches and nuggets and 
strips and all that kind of stuff. Now, they also made great coleslaw, but not enough people besides me bought the coleslaw. And so they discontinued the coleslaw. But when they discontinued the coleslaw, they apologized for discontinuing it, and they put the recipe on their website so that you could go home and make Chick-fil-A coleslaw. Now, I eat at Chick-fil-A a lot, and they're not cheap. In fact, they're kind of expensive. But you get what you pay for. Great tasting food. Number three, let's talk about their values. They have a system called owner operators. You know, unlike franchisees like McDonald's or Burger King, that somebody may can own 100 units, you can only own one unit. You're the owner operator. You own your restaurant and you're in your restaurant. Have you ever wondered why teenagers at Chick-fil-A are better than teenagers at other places? It's because they're trained. It's because the owner's in the building. And the owner is training and recognizing and rewarding these teenagers for giving great service. Here's another thing I like about their values. If you save money for college, if you're a teenager and you're saving money for college through a payroll deduction at Chick-fil-A, they match the deduction. So if you save $200 a week, you have $400 because they put $200 in there. You've also noticed they're closed on Sundays. This is an organization that's very religious and believes in taking the Sabbath off. And they do it everywhere, including pro football stadiums. In many cases, like in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, Chick-fil-A has a restaurant, but not on Sundays. On Sundays, the restaurant in the stadium, like every other restaurant, is closed. Let's talk about attitude. They do things like they give you free drink refills. When uh, you say thank you, they say my pleasure. Most importantly to my wife, they have clean restrooms, restrooms that you can almost eat off the floor. And then I've really watched and been amazed at how they've adjusted during the COVID pandemic. Their operations are exceptional. They simply get it. They put you in line. They come out. They bring you your food. They socially distance. They're doing things the right way. And finally, they're advertising. They've doubled down on college football. They realize the college football audience is the audience that likes to eat at Chick-fil-A. They used a partnership with ESPN to really build their breakfast business. For years, they weren't open for breakfast. And then they realized they had the opportunity to grow their uh, breakfast business, uh, largely biscuits, chicken biscuits, bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits, other breakfast items. And they used college football in a partnership with ESPN to do that. They also have a, had a wonderful campaign with the cows, where the cows said, don't eat hamburgers, eat more chicken. Very successful uh, media campaign. You've probably seen a number of the billboards that had the cows. Uh, they can't spell very correctly, but encourage you to eat more chicken. Today's ad campaign is about the A in Chick-fil-A. The A stands for attitude. Uh, and, and it's real people that work at Chick-fil-A telling those stories. You know, their history, their food, their values, their attitude, their advertising, it all adds up to their brand. It all matters because everything matters. Great brands work in concert across all marketing, communications, and operations disciplines. Great brands last. So how are the brands you are working with? Do they measure up? I hope so. It's time to welcome my pal Vince Thompson back to the bridge, a native of Chatham, Alabama, and a proud Auburn University graduate. Vince has built one of the premier marketing agencies in the country, working with clients like Coca-Cola and Aflac, among others. And now he has a brand new book, so let's welcome Vince back to the bridge. Hey, pal, welcome back. Captain, always a pleasure and always an honor. And I can tell you, I have really, really missed you in Charlotte this summer. I'm, uh, I need a good need a good dose. We need some uh, good shrimp and grits over at the Highlands Bar and Grill. Well, we do. You know, I uh, Charlotte told me the other day, she said, you know, honey, I married you for better or for worse, but not for this. Uh <laughs> 
I, I, I mean, you know, for a couple that dated for 35 years, I mean, this is uh, this is just been a little too close. And I, and, and, I, and I don't know why she keeps a packed suitcase next to my bed for me. No, I can't. Uh, I, I don't know why that she would. We, I can't figure out why she would do that. And, uh, but but I tell you, if you uh, you needed you needed a, a refuge, you can always come down to uh, to Hotland and we'll uh, we'll keep each other company and and, um, and 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 cover a lot of ground. Well, I know that um, uh, Delta Airlines is concerned that I have been solely responsible for the decline in their share price because I have not been on a flight since I left Nashville when the SEC basketball tournament yep. ended. Um, and so I think I'm having some sort of jitters and withdrawal symptoms um, from not doing it. But, you know, our business, um, there's not much business. And yep. if there's not any business, there's no reason to get on an airplane. Um, hey, I want to start the conversation today. You know, hey, you know, I'm proud of you in so many ways. But Thank you. what you've done with Melt You and the young people that you've influenced and touched um, is nothing short of phenomenal. And I love the fact that you're now doing a profile on what I call a Melt You alumnus. I, I love that because that's the real testimony. And it really is a testimony, if we think about it, when you did the campaign for the 75th anniversary of the SEC, the story of character, mm -hmm. that whole campaign was about how intercollegiate athletics influenced a person to go on to do great things in society. Mm -hmm. And now you're repeating that with your own people that you've touched. But this year in the COVID, you, you didn't punt. You just pivoted. So talk about yeah. what you did with that. Well, you know, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words and thank you so much for, uh, for having me back on. And like I said, you know, miss you guys really, really well, but really a lot, but you know, in the, uh, a couple of, uh, of, of starting points, one, um, I've been very, very blessed. You know, as you know, I grew up in rural lower Alabama, Chatham, Alabama, population 800, one red light, dad was the mayor, Mayberry esque existence. And, um, Auburn was the biggest place I'd ever been. And out of just great serendipity or fortunate luck, fortunate luck, um, my first journalism class was taught by David Housel, the head of sports information. And I was just, I went to, I was going to be a sports writer and go back to the Mobile Press Register and um, fascinated the locker room, the sidelines, the press box. And, and one of my great lessons to the, to the students is I'm like, you know, hey, after that class, I went up and took that shot. I said, hey, Mr. Howes, I'd love to be a part of this. And he said, come over this afternoon. And that led me on this amazing four-year journey to Auburn and a 40-year uh, journey so far. And hopefully it'll continue to go on. But, but I made a commitment to myself then that if I was ever in a position to help others and other students, that I would. And fortunately, I've been able to to do that. And so, you know, coach, we had been doing my, one of my labor loves is, is to, to go around and, and, um, and, 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 and teach college kids about really how to get the jobs and the internships because they're getting great education within the walls, but maybe not totally exposed that the campus is the ultimate professional lab. And so I'd speak 20, 30 times a year. We, you know, over time, 10 or 15 years, we'd get several hundred resumes and then I'd say, well, heck, I'll take as many as I can. And we would have 40 coming in every summer. And you were so gracious with your time uh, to come teach these kids. But I had a yearning to share it outside the walls of the agency. But didn't, you know, you nobody really thought about Zoom and those types of things even last summer. And so when everything hit the fan, one of the first, we had 40 kids coming in. I was overwhelmed because to, to your point, you were in Nashville. I had just come back from taking my son on a birthday trip. We were preparing to activate our 18th Final Four great victory lap in Atlanta, hundred of people on the ground to activate for Coca-Cola. And um, but the, the record stopped to scratch. And um, but immediately I started hearing from these kids from all over the country who had applied, and they were like, please don't abandon us. Please do something. And I was like, Well, you know, there's a calling. And I called uh, my folks and I said, well, a couple things. The world has stopped, you know, our busiest time of the year, except college football season. I said, let's do something 
let's do something good for the kids, but it'll also keep melt out in a positive forward facing way in the industry. So goodwill became good business. And then it dawned on me, I'm like, Hey, there's so many people like, you know, Captain Rick Jones of fish bait who want to share their wisdom with the kids, but they may not have had, had the same platform that melt you had had. And so, you know, I had never hosted a podcast, but, um, I just called it. I started calling people and I said, well, hey, will you share your wisdom, your career path, your opportunity, your networking and opportunities with our kids? And we're going to put this effort behind it. And we now have uh, over a thousand five hundred kids. It's uh, 60 podcasts in the can. We'll have another hundred, um, you know, by the end of next year. Uh, I think we're getting you on at one o'clock today. We've had Garth Brooks manager. We've had Commissioner Sankey. We've had President of Coke. We've had the President of NASCAR. I mean, but I'm also uh, enlightening these kids, inspiring these kids, and also teaching them how to network in a virtual environment. And I got to tell you, um, in the spirit of silver linings, it's absolutely been one of the most professional and personal fulfilling things that I've ever done. And we're, we're having tremendous success stories even now in a virtual, uh, world. And then, and then my, my inspiration is to challenge everybody in our industry, uh, to reach out and help these kids too, because we're doing a lot of things in the virtual environment that we never would have dreamed about in a physical environment. And the other thing is I'm not sure I ever had time to do some of these things. And so getting off the hamster wheel after 40 years has allowed me to really, really do what I love. And, and it's been very inspiring to see and hear uh, the impact we're making on students really all over the country. Well, and the other thing you're doing is you're, you're giving them real life. I mean, you know, yep. so, so, so many of these sports management programs without – Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're going to need to take you off speaker. We're getting, yeah. getting the feedback. Okay. So, Is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll start over there. Um, you know, one of the things that you're doing that I, I think students appreciate is that you're, you're giving them real life stuff. You know, too many right. of the sports administration academic programs are taught by guys that have never done anything. Um, right. You know, and in this case, you, you've got people that have been there, done that, right. passing along wisdom that I think is is extremely valuable. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. We, we kind of did a similar thing here. Ryan said, Dad, look, we, you know, the door shut. I mean, it, it, it literally shut. And, right. you know, we're involved in selling country music. There's no country music. There's no college sports. There's, you know, none of the things that we sell were available. And he right. said the same thing. Let's just go produce content. Let's let's just go get stuff. Let's, uh, let's just, you know, teach. Let's do those kinds of things. And it's been very gratifying from that standpoint. But you've really you know, done a great service. And and what's interesting is once you have that content, once you have these podcasts out there, then, you know, other generations of kids can go back right. and, and look at that kind of stuff, which I think is really, really neat. And so now you got a new book, Bill Brand New, coming out in partnership with my good friends here in Charleston, the Advantage Book people. Yeah, and, they're uh, amazing. Yeah, they're great people. Uh uh, Adam, you know, has been a friend for a long, long time, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm I'm proud of the business they've built. I mean, oh my goodness, you know, the guy. Got is, a, by the way, it's a machine. Well, I mean, he got out of Clemson, and you know, kind of had a vision, and has absolutely done a miraculous job of of building this publishing company that I would consider to be as good as any publishing company in the world. And you've he had a, you've, one of the best. You, yeah, you've had a great experience with him, right? Well, I'll tell you, uh, it is one of those, again, it's one of these crazy silver lining stories is that after the stuff hit, I'm like, well, what the heck are we going to do? And, and I, you know, we had to make some painful choices within the organization, but there, but I also, I couldn't just close the whole organization down. And so I said, well, let's do something good. I'm going to manufacture some work. For my people, it's going to keep us a forward facing out there. Uh, and, you know, uh, coach, in this other spirit of silver linings, I had been thinking about putting a fresh brand coat of paint on the melt house and didn't know how to do it. Wanted to do it. 
didn't have time to do it. You know, you're on this giant hamster wheel uh, because we're known as a great event and experiential marketing agency, which is great. But I knew we did so many more other things that I couldn't convey or convince clients and prospects that we did, even though we were great at producing content and social media. So I went to my, my, my peeps and I said, here's the, here's the strategy. We're going to reposition Melt as a media company and a multi-platform company and a social media company and a content company. And we're going to do it through a program that helps thousands of people. So they were like, huh, that actually makes a lot of sense. And then, and then having the tools to be able to do that. But to your point about advantage, it's a, it's a great story. I was reading a newsletter and the line struck me. It said, hey, if you now have time to write that book that you've ever wanted to write, now is the time. Click here. And it literally took me into advantage. And the team, they called a couple of days later. And I said, look, I've got tons of speeches and videos from I've delivered for over the years. And I said, I really I want to share this wisdom on a bigger platform, particularly now that I know. Uh, virtual internships, entry-level jobs, it's going to be really, really, really hard because my theory is that so many people in our business are unemployed that they're going to be willing to take a lesser job for a lesser salary, and it's going to further squeeze and depress the entry-level job market, and then kids are going to start questioning, should I be spending $200,000 and have to be going through this? And so it was, it was, it was still driven by the true north of, of helping the kids, but but um, I had, like I said, I had always uh, wanted to share this knowledge because I see, like you do, thousands of resumes a year. We see what good uh, job seekers and intern seekers do. We see what they don't do. Uh, and again, they're getting a great education within the walls of the campus or the university, but not necessarily getting prepared for the walls outside now and particularly the tumble cycle is going to be, you know, just so tremendous uh, out there. And we were able to kind of modify some of that advice in a, in a, in a, in a virtual environment. And then it's kind of caught on now within um, the universities. I've, I'm a, I'm t- I've got about 25 virtual classes that I'm in the middle of teaching. We've done Vanderbilt. We've done um, Clemson. We've done Georgia. I actually taught a marketing class with Trevor Lawrence in attendance recently, which um, was a little bit of an out of body. So the law of unintended consequences, particularly if you don't lose anybody during this pandemic, has been, I mean, like I said, I mean, just just amazing. And the testimonials, I mean, we got some kids and parents that are you know, literally in tears about some of the things that we, we've been able to do. But I've, I had always, you know, like I said, you'd inspired me when you wrote your book and I'm like, I always wanted the book, but I didn't want it to be a, a, a an ego stroke or gratuitous. I wanted it to have an impact, and uh, it's a fascinating process. I will tell you, it's a fascinating process. Well, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in the old saying, "If it's to be, it's up to me." And I think one of the things that you're doing in in, in putting out a book called Bill Brand You is is you're making it clear to young people, it's up to you. Mm-hmm. You know. You know, my daddy said it, if he said it one time, he said it a hundred times to me. He said, son, the world does not owe you a living. Mm-hmm. And, and, and clearly we believe that, you know, jointly. And, and, and you're telling young people, look, you can do great things. You can do anything you want, but it's up to you. <laughs> right, right. And so well, talk a little bit about Bill Brand You. Well, you know, these, these, these kids, this generation, they're the most sophisticated consumers and uh, technology and digital and social media. Think about the old days. If we wanted to do some research on a target, we had to go to the library. We had to get an encyclopedia or yellow pages or a research resource guide, and they look at me like I've you know, four eyes. And so I set the stage of Bill Brand New is, first of all, I'm like, look, if anybody can do this, if I did it, you can do it. And it doesn't matter what it is, pursue it with passion. And then recognize that you're in this amazing environment. And, 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 and uh, you know, we pray that COVID passes where you're in this amazing laboratory for four or five, six years, not only for sports, 
But if you want to put on an event, a charity, a cause, career development, alumni, we've uncovered in the podcast so many other opportunities within an athletic department. It had never dawned on me that mental health was a great need among student athletes now. It had dawned on me that data analytics among season ticket holders was a space, but not to the depth now because fans aren't able to go to the games as much. And so we wanted to call out and say, hey, look, and, and, and also you, you need to uh, uh, recognize yourself, step away from yourself, and begin building your own personal brand. What, what does that mean? Identify what are your brand traits? What are your brand values? What are your brand attributes? Who do you want to mimic? Do you want to mimic Rick Jones? If you do, study everything there is about it. Position yourself in the marketplace and make a destination, make a vision about where you want to, 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 to go and then look around you within the campus uh, and begin that pursuit like I did with sports information. Begin to and, – and, and, we and you know, Rick, some of the things that we're teaching them is that – is that great grades are great. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't make great grades. I couldn't pay attention. I love to write. I got good in the journalism. I always wanted to be in the press box and the sidelines and all that rather than the classroom. But but I'm, I'm, I'm teaching them how to position their brand. But, you know, your resume is a blind date. Uh, every interaction you have with Rick Jones is an audition. You've got three to ten seconds uh, of the amount of time it passes a billboard on the interstate to make that impression. And so – once you've established that brand positioning, your lens, your values, your reputation, then how do you begin positioning that in social media? Because you have the tools. And so then we talk about the resume. So I call it the inverted pyramid process where you lead with your passion, you lead with your objective, you lead with showing me your initiative and self-starting and accomplishments. Then you got to tweak the romance, the language like don't say you were a coffee server or a barista, say you were on the front lines of consumer behavior interacting with hundreds of customers per day, those types of things. And then, and then ladder it all the way in. You know, if you're an Eagle Scout or student athlete or president of an organization, that's how you position that. And then, and then the second thing is, is that we call it, do you pass the grandma test on social media? If you don't want your grandmother to see it, don't post it because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go look at your social media profile and we're going to see what type of judgment that you're using because you and I are going to invest tens of thousands of dollars of time, energy and money and resources in hiring this employee. And there's thousands of them out there. It's a competition of a thousands for internships and jobs. Now, then we talk about how to position yourself on LinkedIn and then how to know everything there is about Rick Jones as the target by, by understanding Rick Jones's emotional cues when they're in the process of interviewing with you for a job or an internship. And, 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 then, uh, and then we go on and on through the positioning of that. And then we go into what we call bring the heat. So in the old days, you had to dress up. We call your Sunday best. You'd come to your office. Uh, you'd say, you know, you'd greet the front greeter and, hey, Mr. Thompson, and here's my resume and look them in the eye and, and all that stuff. And in a virtual or Zoom environment, those standards still apply. So what does that mean? Have a nice backdrop. Dress nice. Look them in the eye. Know your target. Interview the interviewer. Uh, close the door. No barking dogs. Turn the dadgum phone off because you've got the, you got to make an impression in a virtual environment. And. I taught the, the eight chapters of the book uh, this summer live on a lunch and learn, had hundreds of kids on it and just so many ah highs going off left and right. And so the pre-order of the book is on Amazon, but we've been previewing a lot of chapters. I teach it to a lot of these, uh, a lot of these kids because they need this information right now. I mean, they're stuck in their dorms. You know, my son Carter's a freshman, I mean, a sophomore at Georgia, University of Georgia, and they're learning in a virtual environment. And, some kids don't respond as well in that because they're social creatures. They like to interact. They like the energy. And it's the same thing in the interview process. And think about this. If workers don't go back to their offices ever or in the next six to 12 months, how does that impact, you know, how you get internships and, and, and jobs in this virtual uh, environment? So, I mean, we're, you know, the, you know, they're uh, fortunately, unfortunately, the, all these kids are, you know, we talk about getting thrown off the saddle and getting back on or you're in the tumble cycle. But 
we're all living it in real time right now. And like I said, if I can just help one kid, if I can impact one kid and, and, and help get them placed, um, then, then it's a, it's a job well done and a good day, uh, for me. So it really is truly a passion and a labor of love, but it did help us reposition the entire organization, uh, for the things that we're doing. And then we're going to take these kids and we're going to package them up and take them to corporate America and say, Hey, if you want to reach, you know, use these kids as influencers and reach and test and sample products and all that. Uh, we have thousands of kids that can get your brand message out. And then we create a financial opportunity, uh, for those kids. And then it's laying the groundwork for name, image, and likeness for the student athletes when this comes on board, uh, in 2021. So there was actually a business strategy behind everything that we were doing, but it was all rooted in being a labor of love and doing the right thing. Well, I think that's the essence of capitalism. I mean, I think mm-hmm. capitalism that that serves the greater good, it's okay to serve your own individual good. I mean, right. that's, I mean, last time I checked, only profitable companies can continue to do these kinds of things. If you don't make hey, any money, you, you, you can't do it. You know, interestingly, uh, I've you know I've studied thousands of successful people, and a common denominator is people that understand what their gifts are and maximize their gifts. And our and our educational system is not set up to do that. Um, you, you know, and you know you've got to identify. What your gifts are, I, I tell this story, you know, Ryan would come home with four A's and a B and I'd beat him up about the B. Later on, I realized, hell, he can hire the B. He's going to make a living out of the A's. Um, spot and, on, spot you, you, on. you know, and, and so I think sometimes we fail, kids are failed by the system because, you know, there's a wonderful line that says, God don't make no junk. Everybody has gifts. Right. It's right. just the ones that have never been able to find those gifts. And I think what you're doing is you're trying to get them to understand you've got to lead with your gifts, but then you got to play a role. I mean, there's a little right. bit of it's, it's acting. I mean, it's, it's a process. Well, that's what we talk about. That's why we say, look, every, you got to frame every interaction that you have as an audition and you have to prepare as if an audition, No, if you were auditioning for a play or a speaking role or a television show or, you know, a band or a music. And, 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 you know, like I said, the way academic and academia has been set up, it, it, it's just been set up a, a, a different way than you and I view the world because, you know, we've run businesses and made payrolls and try to make a, you know, a profit here or there and, and, and provide for others. And so it's not necessarily ever a criticism of the academia, but it's just say, how can we, how can we complement it and how can we enhance it and how can these two work together? Because I will, and this is one man's opinion, um, but I believe that you're going to see a uh, massive reevaluation questioning um, of the basic value of a four year, particularly liberal arts education. So, and that's one thing we're going to evolve out of Melt University. We're going to start producing a series of masterclass style videos where Rick Jones is teaching somebody how to actually build a sports marketing firm or how to put on uh, a tour or an experiential uh, or, you know, what's the next evolution of the fan experience? And so, like I said, we, we, we don't want to challenge it or, or criticize it, but we certainly want to compliment it because the other thing is, is that these kids are going to demand it. The parents are going to demand it. They have the tools. They have the technology. I mean, Ryan went to full sale. They've been a leader in that. Uh, uh, developing a practical education. SCAD has done it well. And I think you're going to see a fundamental shift in the landscape around that, or these vaunted institutions will never go out of business because, I mean, you know, you've got the accounting and the engineering and the, and the nursing, and you have those vertical specialties, but in liberal arts in this horizontal space, I think you're going to see a massive, uh, I think you're going to see a massive uh, people. At least that's what I see and what I'm hearing from parents and kids, you know, everywhere. So a kid will go, well, why do I need, uh, a biology class if I want to work in the world of professional golf? And that's a valid question. You know, whether we like it or not, I'm like, well, hey, that, you know, I took 
you know, Spanish almost kept me from graduating from Auburn. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I probably should have tried to pass it, but I'm like, I'm never going to use Spanish. I want to be a sports writer. So, so I, you know, I think we'll see a lot of fundamental shifts in here. And I, and I think we're seeing the, the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion. I think you're going to see maybe hundreds of liberal arts colleges go out of business from this. Mm-hmm. The other thing nobody's paying attention to is, is the birth rate decline. I mean, there yep. are so few teenagers in America right now, so you're going to have yep. a smaller pool of people that yep. are going to question, why do I do this? I mean, I, you know, I look at, and I hate to be this way, but, you know, somebody came to me the other day and said, you know, I have $300,000 in student loan debt. I said, well, yeah. what was your major? Art history. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, I a whole lot of jobs no. in art history. And so, no. and now you want to blame, you know, somebody else, society or, I, you know, or the university for selling you a pig in the poke. At some point, you got to have some personal responsibility. Yeah. And I think that's probably Bill Brand you starts with a little bit of that. <laughs> well, that, you know, everybody's got a, uh, and, and one of the stories I relate to back when I first got to Auburn, I mean, you literally, I, I say, I'm, you know, Forrest Gump and, you know, Winston Groom just passed last week, rest his soul. And, and, um, uh, we had the you know pleasure of, of filming him because you, you know, obviously you were instrumental in helping us, you know, win that business commissioner slide and all that. But, but when I got to Auburn, I was overwhelmed and it immediately dawned on me that there was a caste system here of the haves and the have nots. And, and that's not good or bad, but I'm like, you know, Hey, some kid going to pace Academy and I went to Chatham high and this kid has, you know, traveled to seven countries, and I may have been to a Saints game in New Orleans or Opryland in Nashville. I was like, God, they got a – and by the way, I had a tremendous public education. I had public school education. I wouldn't trade – you know, I fished 200 days a year. I wouldn't trade it with anybody on the planet. But it dawned on me pretty quick. I'm like, hey, these um, – you know, um, I'd never I'd never seen a eye size shirt or – Street torn shoes or plaid breeches that my good buddy Keelan Wheeler had on. I mean, I thought these guys had landed from Mars. And so I was like, the only thing I know is two things. I'm going to outwork you, everybody. And I think I got pretty good ideas about how things work. So it may take me a day or two because I'm the tortoise, but I'm going to outwork you and I'm going to build one heck of a business. And that is what crystallized immediately when I got to Auburn. I didn't know the manifestation of it. But I knew somehow I'd outwork. And then again, uh, you know, I had the fortuitous encounter with David Housel. Uh, and this is what I encourage these kids to do. Go take the shot. Well, you what did. I-, I mean, you took the shot. You know, my, my partner, Ron Cook, has a great line. He says, you know, coincidence is when God chooses to be anonymous. Um, exactly. I mean, there was no coincidence that you meet David Housel. But you had free will. You could have been a a yeah. mouse and said, great, close your book and left the room, but you didn't. What if I, what if I just walked out and gone to lunch? Right. But you didn't, you know? And so I think, you know, part of it is young people need to understand that entrepreneurism begins with you. I mean, it yeah. begins with you as an entrepreneur. What are you going to do to better yourself and where are you going to take shots? And, you know, I mean, you know, I laughingly tell everybody, look, I, I do an audio podcast because I have a face for radio. And, right, and, 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 but I, I dated a lot of really pretty girls. And you know why? I ask. Because you ask. Yeah. And there were a lot of really pretty girls that people said, she's too pretty. She'll never go out with me. I never had that problem. I was stupid right. enough. Now, I did remember one girl one time I asked her if she'd like to go to dinner on Friday night. And she said, she wasn't hungry on Friday night. So, uh, <laughs> well, you know, Rick, the people ask us what we do and I say, we're in the rejection business. <laughs> and I, and one of the, and one of the things I say in the book is the letters N O don't spell. No, it's the first two letters of the words. Not yet. And I go, and, 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 and we, we, this generation, and I'm pretty hard on them sometime for a couple of reasons. One is that everybody doesn't get a trophy. Yeah, you know, I can remember I never won punt, pass, and kick, and I would go under the bleachers and cry, and my dad would come under there and, and uh, you know, thank God d wasn't around back in the day, and he'd say, well, what did you expect? You didn't go practice. So get up and, 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 and wipe your tears. And when I got to Auburn, first day, I went to a Spanish class, 
where they were speaking all in Spanish only. I'd never had a Spanish class. My next class was a philosophy class where the professor said, there is no God. Check your Christian beliefs at the door. And at noon, I'm calling my dad in tears going, Dad, I'm, I'm coming home. He goes, oh, no, you're not. Get your butt back up there and go back to class that afternoon and keep grinding. And so I think in a silver lining way, what we're going through is going to is going to uh, rip the Band-Aid of the, of the trophy participation trophy generation. The second thing is, is I tell these kids, they job hop every three to six months. They think they're going to be a CEO or Zuckerberg, who's a unicorn, after six months. And I'm like, you can't determine anything in any form of relationship in six months. Give it a little time. If you want to share, you can have the heat, but, but I don't think you want it right now. Do everything you can do to learn about that job. And then if it's a year... Then you've learned and move on, but but uh, uh, I think in a in a in a good way, it's going to be a resetting of some of the expectations that these kids and these students may have had about their success prior to COVID, and that's not going to be that's not necessarily a bad thing. And like I said, I I love these kids to death, but I'm I'm an old school you know, guy, they say, you know, you, you, they come to me after two or three months and they go, what's my career path? And I'm like, it's that glass door swatting you on your rear end on the way out. Uh, I mean, like, 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 like you and I have been doing this four or five decades and we're still grinding as if we were, you know, you know, 40 years younger. And not only we, grinding, but still trying to learn. Learning every day. I mean, you know, learning, I mean, learning, I mean learning and this day. generation better realize that the the, yeah. the the rapid rate of change is going to be overwhelming uh, unless you're a lifetime learner. And and it, if it, you it, if it's, you, it's, you it's, by yeah. the way, it's the speed of light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you look, you had a successful agency. I've always said, you know, when somebody says to me, "Tell me about Vince Thompson," I unequivocally say, "The most creative guy I know." I mean, well, his, his brain works differently than everybody else's brain. <laughs> he goes, no, no, but, but but seriously. And so you built an agency kind of in the image of your brand. Melt, right. in my opinion, is an extremely creative agency in so Thank many you. ways. And yet you looked at COVID and said, we got to be different. Yeah, We got to change. Yeah. I, well, let me tell you this. I said, I'm not backing down now. Are you kidding I, I, I told my people, I said, look, the easiest thing for me to have done would have been to have gone fishing in Orange Beach for about six months. My son was out. We could have gone down, hung out with my buddies. You know, you and I spent a lot of great time down there. It's a wonderful place. But I said, you know, two things. I've come too far to back down now. Secondly, this is a golden, golden opportunity to reset and recalibrate a lot of things with our core business and evolve it in ways that we never would have dreamed six months ago. And like I said, I, you know, uh, I have this joke and I always tongue in cheek because this, this COVID thing is, has been, you know, so tragic for so many, many, many lives. But if, if, if I don't lose any levels, I'm going to kind of say, you know, sort of COVID saved my life because it enabled me to do things I had been wanting to do for years. And I was like, not growing frustrated, but I, but it's beginning to accept the reality. Like, you know, Hey, I'm on this giant hamster wheel and I'm never going to be able to get off of it. And so literally, I mean, Monday to March 16th is, you know, the world stopped, um, uh, spent about a week or two, uh, really kind of recalibrating. And obviously there was some, some tough decisions that we had to make because in your business and in my business, you know, we went from 90 miles an hour to zero miles an hour, literally in a day and um, millions in revenue and millions in lives. And, you know, it was uh, emotional because it was my 18th final four and you were involved and I back in 03. And it was always just a fun victory lab for us in Atlanta with, you know, representing Coke for two decades. And, and that just, I mean, that got, jerked out of our arms immediately and i said all right we're gonna we're gonna lick our wounds for a day or two but you don't drive an automobile through the rearview mirror drive it through the windshield we got to go and if some people don't want to do that that's fine with me but here's what my plan is and i was very succinct and hey here's our destination and on top of that kids were calling and parents were calling from all over the country saying help us 
And I'm like, all right, well, that's that's the easiest thing to do. We're a communications or marketing agency. We've got access to technology. We know how to develop content. You know, let's 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 put this together. It, you know, one step at a time. I made a list of everybody I wanted to reach out to for the next 12 to 18 months and said, hey, this may we all thought this was going to end in Memorial Day, too, by the way. Everybody forgets that now. But we're like, all right, well, we'll be all back in, you know, we'll be back in the saddle, Memorial Day, summer will be back, events will be back, flatten the curve, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, now we're going into the seventh <clears> month <throat> and uh, with no end in sight. And, you know, so, you know, and, but, you know, other thing, Coach, I, I had such great faith. I said a prayer and I said, you know, God, I'm going to turn this over to you and um, just give me some guidance and I'm going to grind. And that was my kind of my mantra, guidance and grind. And I really didn't really – I've never worried about my survival in the core business because whatever happens, it's going to – it's the destiny anyway. So I don't really – I don't really think about it a lot, to be honest with you. Well, Winston Churchill said famously, "Never waste a crisis." Um, right. And, but 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 people don't people have forgotten they that was not an overnight success in England. I mean, they're being bombed every day, every yeah. day, loss of lives, no chance to to mount any type of offense. He's having to persuade. Franklin Roosevelt, who had a country that said, we're not going to get involved. And that, that was a long process. And I think we can learn a lot mm-hmm. from staying the course. The other thing I had to learn, and this was hard for me, I'm such a long-term planner. You know, I'll drive mm-hmm. people crazy. I have this little red book on my desk that I could tell you mm-hmm. where I was going to go on vacation in the year 2035. And, mm-hmm. you know, that that ended. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. my idea of long-term planning was what am I going to do tomorrow uh, but but I finally learned what Coach Wooden had called the precious present, which was, you know, you can learn from the past and you certainly can prepare for the future, but what are you going to do today? This, mm-hmm. is, this is the only time you got is today, the precious present. And clearly, you've done that. Y'all have done that um, admirably um, in such a way. Now, let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. How... Do you believe COVID is going to change college sports? Um, well, well, and, and you, you know that's a loaded question. And and, and I, I, I I'll, I'll say um, two two uh, quotes that I uh, live by that that reinforce what you just said: "Man plans and God smiles." And the second one is: "Change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Choose wisely." And, um, those are my mantras. And so, so how is COVID going to change and impact college athletics? Well, let's unpack that. Prior to COVID, one could argue that seismic changes were in the pipeline, um, for college athletics. What do I mean by that? Millions spent on, on buildings, beautiful, sophisticated buildings and programs um, in no particular order. You know, and you have a company devoted to this engagement, declining attendance. Why um, can they afford to go uncertain kickoff times, the college football experience versus going to the Mercedes Dome? Say I pick on my uh, alma mater, Auburn, sitting on a hot metal bench in the middle of the day, uncertain start times. You can't plan people with young kids, you know, have soccer and baseball matches on Saturday afternoon. You can spend a fraction of what it costs for a season ticket and get an 80 inch television sitting the comfort of your own living room uh, and drinking your good ice cold Coke with your friends and your family and your and your grill and watch 25, 30, 40, 50 games. Um, so there was, there was a lot of, lot of pressure, um, pressure on the rights fees from, you know, ESPN and cord cutters, um, you know, uh, so, so, you know, on and on and on and on. And um, so we were, we were hurtling toward a seismic change prior to COVID. Now I think, Long term, in a good way, it's going to reset um, college athletics in a positive way. What do I mean by that? Um, 
making forcing changes to the to the fan attendance and fan experience, forcing changes to fixed game times, um, forcing uh, the round robin and the competition within. I mean, Nick Saban's been wanting to do this for years, for goodness sake. He finally got his way. Fans love it. You know, they don't want to go see, you know, um, Alabama, Louisiana, Monroe. They no, they just don't. Right. They're not. They're right. not. They're, they're not going to do it. Right. They want to see not, Alabama play do. Ohio State. Yeah. They're not going to do yeah. it. So I think that I think those are positives. I think um, where where I get challenged sometimes, Coach, is that I don't want these athletic directors to use COVID as a cover to eliminate non-revenue sports because I think that is going to be one of the great tragedies and travesties. If they do that, well, it's and, it's really easy to cut sports, isn't it? That's 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 easy. These guys make millions of dollars, and they can't make the hard calls, which is figure correct. out a way to pay for it. Correct. And 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 so 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 I'm advocating resetting the whole the whole uh, kit and caboodle, and we all focus on Trevor and Tua and Jake Fromm and Justin Fields and all that. But I like to focus on the 499. 1,995 student athletes who com- who compete and commit with the same passion that the superstars do. And so I use the Auburn women's equestrian team. And I think name, image, and likeness could be the salvation of, um, uh, of quote unquote, non-revenue sports, because you got to think about this. If we cut these out, we're going to cut out the, the pipeline to the Olympics f- uh, mostly coming from these student athletes. Secondly, let these kids on the Auburn women's equestrian team, I pick on them a lot, but let them go get sponsorships for saddles and bits and braids and boots and feed and seed. And, and, and then the NCAA and their infinite wisdom said, Oh, we're not going to allow you to promote feminine products. And I'm like, what? I get the, I get the booze and the porn and the tobacco uh, but really, I mean, like I could take a hundred thousand young ladies to corporate America empowerment, and I could bring in a hundred new companies who'd never had a thought or idea or desire to advertise in college athletics because they didn't fit within a category or they didn't want to spend a million dollars at a university or $10 million with a major network or something like that. And I could take a million bucks and impact the lives of a hundred thousand female student athletes. And that's where this is going. And then figure out the financial model where the kid gets a piece of the action, the team gets a piece of the action, and the the athletic department gets a piece of the action. And then revamp how, you know, you don't have to play field hockey for Minnesota and you don't need to be traveling to um, Texas to have a match. So reformulate how these kids compete with one another. But for goodness sakes, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And then, and, and then coach, you know this better than anybody because you were one. Student athletes make the best employees in the world. So let's go to all the sponsors in college athletics and the rights holders and the alumni and the low hanging fruit. Say, look, let's set up career opportunities. Let's set up training. Let's set up real world things like it's in my book. Let's set up fairs. Let's set up internships. Let's set up. Um, uh, uh, a job and career opportunities. The only thing you hear out of athletic directors right now is the word compliance as it relates to the NIL. How about compliment? How about how about the NCA become a, um, not an enforcement organization but an enhancement organization? Because if they don't, every they're all going to be out of business. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I I use I, I dumb it down and just say that they've gotten so used to playing checkers in a chess world. And, and and they've got to change the direction. Hey, we just got a few more minutes. I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, how good are your Auburn Tigers going to be? Well, the Auburn Tigers are always undefeated at this point in the season. <laughs> and and uh, but no, I I, uh, I I think we're going to be good. I think um, I think the Tigers are good. I you know it's going to be fascinating <laughs> to think about all these teams getting to play one another and, and coach, I got to tell you another kind of weird thing. I was watching uh, my buddy Cam Newton last night 
And I kind of like sort of watching this without any fans. And I know that's an anathema to me and you, but it's almost like watching a video game, right? And 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 and, uh, and so um, I think it's going to be, you know, my good friend Craig Silver's in Baton Rouge this week, and for CBS and the game of the week. I, I think that um, I think when we knew college football was playing, and I've been pretty harsh on on, on Kevin Warren because I think he was a little tone deaf about things, but. Once we knew college football started playing again and then the NFL and all that, people started feeling a little bit better about things. And think about this. You and I could get together and watch SEC football, NFL football, and the Masters in the same dead gum weekend. Who would have thought it, right? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I'm going to give you one point on Kevin. I had a chance to meet with him pre-COVID when he had mm-hmm. just taken the job. And I was very impressed with him. And one of the things I was very impressed with him, he articulated how he thought mental illness was oh, yeah. such a challenge and that and that he was really – and so knowing his mindset of mental illness is something we've got to deal with and we've got to have more resources to address that, for him to have gravitated immediately to the health issues did not surprise me. Right. You know, I think he, you know, I think he overcompensated, uh, you know, a little bit, but I do believe that he really had the right approach that we don't know about this disease. I think clearly once we got new information, new testing, new ways to do it, then he was like everybody else. Okay, we'll figure out a way to do that. Right. One more question for you. So in this crazy 2020 year, who wins the national championship? Well, uh, I've got to give me all kind of those. Now, uh, well, first of all, this relates to Kevin. I totally agree with you. I think that I think the mistake he made was sort of bringing NFL mentality to college athletics, and it's just different. It's different. The culture is different. The way our thought process is different. And I had an opportunity to break bread with him, Commissioner Slive, Anna Slive, and Paul Feinbaum three years ago at Bottega in yep. uh, Birmingham, yep. Yep. and it's fascinating. And the other thing is that he's got a son that obviously plays for Mississippi State in the SEC. He's playing this Saturday. But but I was just – and I, I, what I loved about what Sankey did is that he's like, we don't really have to get in a rush here, guys. We got the end of September, early October, and we can work this out. But as it relates to the national championship, um, I, I, I just love what Trevor Lawrence has done for student athletes everywhere. I had encouraged him. I said, hey, I'll give you 500 million reasons not to go play. Uh, but what he's done for the commitment in his heart and his soul and organizing these players and, and being an advocate for student athletes everywhere, I tell you, Coach, if if we all in the NCA and the conference commissioners and the heads of networks would sit down, and, and this is one thing I advocate, listen to these student athletes a little more, I think we would all better off, it'd be better off as it relates to formulating uh, our strategy and our opinion and our our rules and regulations going forward because this generation of student athletes is the most sophisticated there is, and they ain't backing down. The genie's out of the bottle. The horse is out of the barn. Um, so I'm just such a big fan of uh, of Trevor, and I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, ironically, a big fan of Coach Saban. I really would love to see him uh, break that record, that coaching record, national title record, and I really, really – Really, really impressed with you know his and other coaches' leadership as it relates to listening uh, to these student athletes because I've been around them for forty years and let me just tell you this is all long overdue. Well, I live here in the great state of South Carolina. I see the Tigers regularly. One of the things people better pay attention to is how much depth they have because in a year that you may have kids test positive and have to miss games. Clemson goes three, four deep. I, I've never seen a team with this level of depth. Um, Dabo has just convinced kids come be a part of something bigger than you, and then you got the best player, arguably in the country, that has stepped up to be the biggest leader of anybody I, in the country. I, I got to yeah. tell you, what, what I've been a fan of. You know, I lived in Birmingham for a long time and had been familiar with Dabo since '92. But that just shows you the the really the, the coaching and values and practicing what you preach and living by your values and the impact that, that he's had. And I'm going to tell you, um, he, they may, they may, they're going to be great for 20, 30, 40 years, however long Dabo decides to do that, but it's all rooted in his personal value system. And I think that's a lesson 
for all of us to take uh, going forward is that, you know, practice what you preach, live your values. You're going to have, you know, a bad apple thrown off the saddle every once in a while. But if you can stay consistent and true to yourself, and that's what we tell our students in Melt Years, like, look, pursue your passion, stay true to yourself, uh, stay true to your value system. And, you know, it might be, it might be cold and dark for a day or two. But at the end of the day, you're going to get to the uh, to the other side of that, and, I, and that's what I, you try to do. That's what I'm trying to do, and and it really has been a, a, a gratifying journey so far. But I think we got a lot. We got, all got a lot more to do on this earth. Well, there you have it. It's a great way to end, Powell. I can't thank you enough, and uh, I'll get you back on here soon. So thanks again for being with us today from the bridge. Well, I uh, I appreciate it. You know, you've been you've made major influence on my life for 20, 30 uh, years, decades. You're a mentor, one of the greatest ever. You know, you're the you're the true best idea guy. I remember sitting around uh, with Tom Ford in two thousand two and three. Um, uh, you know, what are we going to do with NABC and Coke and the Final Four and all that? When I had a one guy with a cell phone and you always gave me great opportunities and chances. And, and, um, you know, it's just a tribute to, you know, uh, building and nurturing, uh, and, and, and lifelong relationships and treating those with the, with the, with the preciousness and the value. And I think now more than ever, um, the value of those are, 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 are great. And so I really appreciate, um, the time that you've given me today and I look forward, uh, I think we're about to do it soon, but, uh, uh, right back at you on the uh, on the melt you because uh, every time by the way every time you come and speak every summer you're far and above rated the 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 most popular speaker at melt you so you're always number one out of fifty so I'm looking forward to you sharing your uh, your wit and wisdom with our students uh, all over the country. Well, I appreciate it. I love you, and I'm really proud of you. Thank you, sir, and uh, and uh, give a big hug to uh, Shar, and I miss you guys. All right, see you, pal. Bye. Let's talk about your personal brand from the soapbox. I wrote a book a few years ago called The Business Tithe, and here's what I wrote then about personal brands. Close your eyes and imagine you're attending a funeral. The beautiful church is packed. There are flowers everywhere. All of your friends and family are there. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that it's, it's your funeral. <laughs> when the clock has run out, I'm afraid, someone gets up to give your eulogy. What do you want them to say about you and your life? What will they say about what you did with your life? Do you like what they are saying, or do we need to rewrite that script? What do you really want them to say? That's the ultimate vision for your life. In one sentence, what do you want someone to say about you and your life when it's over? Here's what I hope someone will say about me. Rick Jones was a good and honorable man who always pulled his own weight and found a way to support his family and lots of others throughout his life while enjoying all of the blessings of this world. So here's some key phrases here. Good and honorable. I want to be remembered as honest, kind, thoughtful, and godly. Pulled his own weight. Strong initiative work habits, work capacity, I made my own way. Support, unselfish, giving, a friend, enjoying family, friends, activities, sports, places, food. Think about what you want your personal vision to be and go make that vision happen. Let's close back on the road with Rick. Last week, we talked about lessons I learned from Coach John Wooden. Coach ended up at UCLA in Los Angeles. And there's a terrific old school hamburger joint in LA called the Apple Pan. It was opened on April 11th, 1947. 
They only have 26 seats at a U-shaped counter. They only take cash. You see them make freshly ground beef hamburgers right in front of you. They serve French fries in paper cones. And they have amazing homemade pies. Apple, pecan, banana cream, coconut cream, chocolate cream, peach cream, or strawberry cream. Where do you start? Did I mention old school? Oh, yes. They still do it like they did in the 1940s. It's the Apple Pan on Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles, California, on the road with Rick. Another show is in the books. Thanks to my pal Vince Thompson for being with us today, and thanks to each of you for listening in today. We'll be back next week with another trip from the bridge.